Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto married Ino Yamanaka in the future. 16 year old Ino is stuck in the body of her older self. Now she must embark on the journey of an adult, a wife, and a mother while deep down she's still just a child herself. What does the future have in store for her? Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 33, Unknown Intentions Karen's eyes slowly opened, pain shooting through her limbs. She groaned, remembering her circumstances. The drug Astra had given her had worn off and she could see clearly now. She was in a large room, judging from its concrete walls and floors and lack of windows it was probably a basement. The only exit was a flight of stairs, that lead to a heavy metal door that opened upwards. Karen struggled against the chains that bound her to the wall, but she felt drained. The metal probably absorbed or blocked chakra, and since she could not sleep properly, she was exhausted. And she had to protect her baby. She had to stay alive for the baby's sake. But she also had to get out of here for his sake. His. Karen laughed to herself. Of course she would want another boy. She loved her boys. And she missed them terribly. The metal door suddenly opened, allowing Astra entrance. Karen glared at the woman as she descended the stairs and approached, a bowl in her hand. You must be hungry, Astra stated. Karen's stomach made an odd noise, proving the Hyuga right. Why would you bring me food? Karen asked. I don't want you to die, Astra replied. That would be pointless. I'm evil, not cruel. Karen wasn't sure if the two could be differentiated because evil and cruel always came hand in hand. Astra kneeled before Karen and lifted a piece of bread to the redhead's lips. Eat, Astra ordered. Karen did not budge and just glared. Astra smirked. Don't eat for yourself, Karen. Eat for your unborn child. I was not aware you cared, Karen spat. Astra just continued smirking. Your child is innocent, I don't kill the innocent. Oh, really? Then why are you after Eno? She's not your Eno. She's not the Eno who abused you. She's innocent. Karen argued. Astra's smirk vanished and her eyes narrowed. Let me tell you a story, Karen, Astra whispered. Several years ago, I was in prison, patiently awaiting for my trial to begin. I'm still not sure why they even bothered with a the trial, they should have just executed me on the spot. I did, after all commit the worst crime there is. Karen froze. She did not like the sound of this. You killed the woman who raised you, Karen whispered. Astra narrowed her eyes. And she killed my father. She challenged his leadership and they battled to the death. She won and was named Hokage. That's not how the Hokage is chosen, Karen retorted. Not in this dimension, no, Astra replied. Mine is different. In my dimension, War is what defines us. Violence is what elects our leaders. And violence is what kills us all in the end. In my dimension, the war never ended. Then shouldn't you strive to end it? Why prolong the violence? Karen asked. I'm not finished with my story yet, Astra retorted. One day while I was still in prison, days away from my trial, I was knocked unconscious by an invisible source. When I came to, there was a voice inside of my head. Can you guess whose voice it was? Karen's eyes widened, memories flooding back to her of the time Eno had been found unconscious several years earlier at the training ground. When the blonde had awoken, she claimed there was a voice in her head, an obvious side effect of her first attempt at using five dimensions to heaven. And it had nearly killed her. Oh yes, Astra smirked. I could hear her, just like she could hear me. I was forced to watch her live in a dimension where there was no war and where my father lived, happily, with the very woman who had murdered him in cold blood. I still don't understand why you are motivated to get revenge on a woman who is innocent, Karen muttered. I don't need you to understand my motivation, Karen. And whoever said I want revenge? Karen blinked and looked up into Astra's blank eyes. That is not your goal. Eno has something of mine, Astra replied. And I want it back. Whether she dies after that, well, that's not my problem. 
It's her fault for intervening when she shouldn't have. Karen frowned, still completely confused. Astra spoke in circles and never fully answered her questions. She was still nowhere near close to understanding the woman's motives. Astra moved and lifted the bread to Karen's lips again. Eat, Astra ordered. Karen obliged, simply because she knew she had to put her unborn child first. When she was finished, Astra stood and prepared to leave, but not before activating her Byakugan and looking straight into Karen's eyes. Sleep, Astra ordered. Karen tried to fight the sudden fatigue that washed over her, but it was futile. The darkness swallowed her whole. Kanaha was glorious. Yoko stared in fascination at the buildings around her, Karama laughing at her expression. The village was completely different from Mabashi, the buildings were newer, the streets were clean and the trees, the trees were so green. But what Yoko loved the most was the six faces that overlooked it all, carved into a mountain top. She had read about the monument in countless books, but there were no words in existence to describe it. The books did not do the real thing any justice. Wow, Yoko breathed in awe. Pretty cool, huh? Karama asked. Yoko nodded. Do you want to meet the man behind one of those faces? Yoko blinked, not sure what Karama meant, and then it clicked. She gaped. Meet the Hokage? Yoko asked. Yeah, Karama hummed. That's why I'm here. Hokage's orders. Sort of. Yoko wanted to say yes, she really did, but then she remembered who the Hokage was. Uzumaki Naruto. He was the reason why people always assumed she was a Kunoichi, just because they had the same last name. He was famous, especially in the Land of Fire, and people were always curious and nosy. And Yoko preferred to keep her past buried deep. Maybe next time, Yoko whispered. Karama nodded. He could feel her turmoil, so he wasn't going to push it. Perhaps if she settled a bit in the village first, she would feel more comfortable. His thoughts immediately went to Ino, the woman would know how to make Yoko feel welcome, but before he could suggest they go to find her, he spotted a familiar figure with dark hair heading towards them. He smirked, time for some fun. Miss Shimura, he greeted the woman when she nearly bumped into him. She was distracted by a scroll she was reading and when she heard his voice, she looked at him in horror. Kakarama, she muttered, her stance suddenly stiff. Yoko frowned, why was this woman so frightened? Interesting scroll. Karama asked with a toothy grin, purposefully showing his canines. The woman nodded slowly, too shocked to respond. Karama just continued grinning and pointed at Yoko. Ayaka, can I call you that? This is my friend, Yoko. Ayaka just nodded again, her dark eyes wide. You alright? Karama asked. Ayaka finally found her voice. What are you doing here? Oh, you know, just visiting, Karama hummed. How is the council? Ayaka's gaze shifted away from Karama when he asked this, which he had noticed years before was a nervous habit of hers. He raised an eyebrow, she was clearly uncomfortable talking about the council. Interesting. How long are you staying? Ayaka changed the subject. This just made Karama more suspicious, because she was obviously dodging the question. Until Naruto no longer needs me, of course, Karama replied. Ayaka pursed her lips, then forced a fake smile. Enjoy your stay then, she muttered. She bowed and quickly turned to jug the way. Karama snorted, he could feel her fear, she wanted to run, but did not want to appear cowardly. Foolish woman, she clearly inherited the trait from her stubborn uncle. Who was that? Yoko asked when Karama started walking again. She represents the Shimura clan on the High Council, Karama explained. She seems to be afraid you, Yoko whispered. That's because she is. Yoko frowned. Why? Karama just smiled sadly and took Yoko's hand into his own. Does it matter? Yoko blushed. No, but, I'm curious. Who are you? How do you know so much about my clan? And what did your friend mean, another Izumaki? Karama sighed and squeezed Yoko's hand. Perhaps you should come with me to see the Hokage, then you will understand. Yoko wanted to shake her head, wanted to pull away and refuse, 
but she knew that she had to stop running from her problems. She had to stop judging everyone in her clan, because her father was only one man and what he did, did not define others with the same name. She knew that, she did, but she still felt nervous. But she so desperately wanted to know, because Karama was so mysterious. Like the saying goes, curiosity killed the cat. So she took a deep breath and nodded her head. Uzumaki Naruto was a very attractive man was what Yoko thought when she first laid her eyes on him. He was clearly several years older than her, but his age did not deter his large smile that made him look like a little boy. Yoko stared, fascinated when Naruto got up from his desk and hugged Kurama. It was unexpected and the most intimate thing she had ever seen Kurama do. And when Naruto returned to his seat, she could finally see Kurama's face. He was smiling too, like he was seeing an old friend for the first time in years. And that's when it clicked. This was the person Kurama had told her about. You have a friend, Naruto stated, his blue eyes focused on Yoko. She blushed and bowed. Despite her nerves, she was in awe. She was standing before the Hokage, the man who had ended the war, the man who had fought for the Biju's freedom. Biju, Yoko's eyes widened and she looked up at Kurama. Blood red hair, vermilion eyes, incredibly powerful chakra, her father's stories about the nine beasts came back to her like a torrent. It also explained Shimura Ayaka's fear of him. She gaped, how had she not noticed before? You alright? Kurama asked. Yoko nodded, not sure if her voice would cooperate if she tried to speak. When she had learned that Kurama wasn't human, she hadn't even considered he was a biju. After all, she had never heard of them being able to take on human form. Would you like a drink? Naruto offered, noticing that Kurama's friend looked petrified. She nodded. Naruto stood and left the office to get her a glass of water, leaving Yoko and Kurama alone. You're... Yoko trailed off before she could finish her sentence. Ah, clicked has it. Kurama asked with a grin. Naruto was your Jinchuriki, how is he still alive? Yoko asked. Uzumaki quirk, Kurama shrugged. You guys never die, it's freaky. Naruto's mother was my Jinchuriki before him, she survived the extraction as well, but she was weakened considerably and died from fatal wounds she received in a battle to protect him. Yoko was speechless. It made sense now, why Kurama knew so much about her clan. He had been associated with them for decades. Yoko wanted to ask him more, she wanted to hear his part of the story, but they were interrupted by Naruto returning. He handed Yoko a glass of water, which she took gratefully. Kurama jumped straight into business. Why did you summon me? He asked. Naruto glanced at Yoko, then back at Kurama. I need your assistance with an urgent matter. We can discuss it in detail later. Kurama frowned, but then he noticed Naruto glancing at Yoko again and he understood. It wasn't something they could discuss in front of her. Yoko also noticed this, because she smiled. I can leave, she offered. Maybe I'll have a look around. I apologize, I don't usually chase people out of my office, Naruto said. Yoko shook her head. It did not bother her. She was an outsider, private and delicate matters of Kanaha was none of her business. A knock on the door interrupted the conversation and although he seemed annoyed at the intrusion, Naruto invited the person inside. Yo, Naruto, Inuzuka Kiba greeted with a toothy grin that could rival Kurama's. I got some boring paperwork for you. Naruto grumbled as he was handed the paperwork, but then a brilliant idea hit him. Are you busy, Kiba? Naruto asked. Nope, Kiba replied, his gaze now shifting to Kurama and Yoko. Hello, Fox, long time no see. Likewise, Kurama returned the greeting. You still smell of dog, I see. Kiba snorted. And you smell like alcohol? The two stared at each other, then burst out laughing. Yoko watched, fascinated. She was still trying to get used to people actually being comfortable in Kurama's presence, in Mabushi she had been the only one not bothered by his inhuman appearance. Naruto cleared his throat, regaining Kiba's attention. Kiba, could you give, I'm sorry, what was your name? Yoko, Yoko introduced herself. She hesitated before adding, Uzumaki Yoko. 
Naruto's eyes widened for a fraction of a second, but his shock quickly melted away into a broad smile. Kiba, I want you to give Yoko a tour of Kanaha, she's visiting with Kurama. Kiba looked at Yoko carefully, almost as if he was sizing her up. You like dogs? Yoko blinked, confused, but nodded anyway. Kiba grinned. Awesome. Let's go. Kiba grabbed her arm and dragged her out of the office much to her surprise. She glanced at Kurama, who just stuck his tongue at her. She rolled her eyes and allowed Kiba to pull her down the halls, down a flight of stairs until they were outside, where a big white dog was waiting for them. Akamaru, Kiba scratched the dog's ears affectionately, this is Yoko. She likes dogs. Yoko, this is my best friend and companion, Akamaru. Hello, Yoko greeted. Akamaru barked in response. He says you smell nice, Kiba stated. Yoko blushed. Oh, really? Or is that just an excuse you use to woo women? She asked, placing her hands on her hips. This time it was Kiba's turn to blush. What? No. He is a ninja dog, they are trained to communicate. Kiba argued. Yoko laughed and patted his shoulder. Whatever you say, now give me that tour, lover boy. Kiba's blush darkened. Sasuke growled as he read the contents of the fake mission scroll that Karen had received. He did not recognize the writing, which worried him. He had turned the house upside down to find it, and nearly kicked himself when he had finally found it in Karen's bedside table drawer. Why hadn't he looked there first? What a waste of time. You all right, father? Masashi asked from the doorway. He had just returned from a mission, only to find the house in a mess. Your mother is missing, Sasuke whispered. Masashi's eyes widened and his eyes darted to the scroll in his father's hands. Where is she? Did you not hear me? Sasuke yelled. She's missing. That usually means I don't have a fucking clue where she is. Masashi stepped back, surprised by his father's outburst. He was used to his father being composed, so to see him so unhinged was a shock. I, I apologize, Masashi muttered. Sasuke's gaze softened, but before he could also apologize, Suijitsu appeared behind Masashi with a hard expression. He squeezed the young boy's shoulder and then motioned with his head for the boy to leave. When Masashi was gone, Suijitsu narrowed his eyes at Sasuke. What the hell is your problem, Sasuke? Shouldn't you be overjoyed that Karen has been taken? Sasuke asked. You've always wanted to drive us apart. That was just fun and games, Suijitsu hissed. Believe it or not, I never wanted that to actually happen. You and Karen are my teammates, the only two still free, I don't want to lose you two. Sasuke sighed and pulled his fingers through his hair. Shit, I'm sorry. I just, everything is going wrong all of a sudden. I don't like it. Hey, I get it man, life gives you lemons and shit and you can't throw the little sour bastards back. Sasuke snorted. When did you get so wise? I've always been wise, idiot, Suijitsu cackled. Now, our teammate is missing, aren't we going to do something about it? Yeah, Sasuke agreed. Yeah, we are. She was dreaming again, she concluded. It was the only way to explain the disjointed feeling she had from the events that unfolded before her. Karen could feel herself walking, but at the same time it felt like she wasn't. It was difficult to comprehend and she knew she would not be able to explain it if someone ever asked her what it felt like. Karen glanced down at her cuffed hands. She was a prisoner? She investigated her surroundings. A dark hall, definitely Kanaha's prison, but it had subtle differences. Two men were walking beside her, both had a forehead protector on. Neither of them looked pleased. Was she in Hashiko's body again? Was this when she was taken to prison for killing? Karen inhaled deeply. It did not make sense. The Hokage in Astra, Hashiko, whatever her name was, was selected through a challenge and the victor became the next leader. Was that not what Astra had told her? So why had she been imprisoned for killing Ino, instead of made Hokage? It did not make sense. In fact, the whole dimension didn't make sense. Just what sort of horrible place did the woman come from? Get in. One of her escorts hissed when they reached a small cell. 
The other escort unlocked the door and pushed her inside. Karen stumbled and collapsed onto the ground. The two men laughed. Have fun rotting in here, one of them jeered. Did you honestly think you'd get away with murder? I bet you hoped you'd be able to take over as Hokage. Pfft. Karen whimpered. I'll have a trial. Yeah, you will, the other escort snorted. But only because Lady Hanabi requested it. Karen whimpered again. Pathetic, the first escort whispered when they closed the door and walked away. His companion laughed in agreement. Karen felt her body move to sit up and for several hours she stayed like that, completely quiet, her eyes focused on the wall in front of her. Karen had lost count of how long she was like that, but after quite some time she started sobbing. Eventually the sobbing turned into wails which echoed through the room. Karen once again felt her heart break for Hashiko, the poor woman had been treated terribly, but that did not mean her actions were justified. Why? Hashiko asked herself. Why would she say that? Karen had no idea what the woman was talking about, but her voice was so raw, so broken, it saddened her. Why? Hashiko repeated. Why, Eno? Another few hours passed in silence and Hashiko remained still in the same position. Karen wondered if this dream would ever stop, and then something powerful swept through her, it felt like an electric shock, but at the same time it felt like fire was engulfing her. She gasped and struggled, grabbing her neck as she tried to breathe. What was happening? Karen could feel Hashiko's panic and fear so clearly, it became her own. An image flashed before her eyes, too quickly to see what it was, but she did remember seeing something akin to pale blonde and blue. And then there was the voice. A voice that appeared out of nowhere. Dimension, it whispered and then vanished. Karen recognized it. She knew that voice, very well. Eno. It was Eno's voice. But not the cold, hard voice of the Eno that Karen had seen in the previous dream Astra had showed her. No, it was a warm voice, it was Karen's Eno's voice. Hashiko's panic rose and she not stood leaning against the wall, trying to fight whatever it was that seemed to be attacking her. She had also recognized the voice, and now she was panicking for a whole different reason. The dead was coming to haunt her. With that thought, Hashiko collapsed again and her mind dived into darkness. Chapter 34, Shimura's Promise Karamo listened. That's all he really could do, listen. He listened as Naruto told him about the council, how they had become corrupted and was plotting against him. He listened how the poor Hokage was lost and that his call for help was his last resort. He listened to his friend, who was tired and so clearly betrayed by people he thought he could trust. Kurama could still remember the weeks that followed his extraction from Naruto. He wasn't usually one to dwell on the past, but as he listened to Naruto explaining the corrupt council and how they might be planning to overthrow him as Hokage, Kurama couldn't help but think back to the events from the past. Because perhaps, if he hadn't been so proud, this whole fiasco could have been prevented. Several years earlier. The sky was covered in thick grey clouds, a clear sign of rain. But for the time being it was still slightly warm and dry, and the people of Kanaha were going on about their day-to-day -day life as much as possible. But there was something different today, you could see it in the way several citizens carried themselves. Some even found themselves constantly glancing at the hospital if they passed it. Why? Because their beloved leader and hero, Uzumaki Naruto, was currently in the hospital, unconscious. And while the medics said he was well on his way to recovery, there were still those who were skeptical and worried he would die. This was nearly on everyone's mind, everyone except for the young Hokage's wife and the very person who put him in the hospital in the first place. Kurama was still trying to adjust to his new body, it was odd having his own physical form after so many years. He had used Naruto's body while in battle before, but that was nothing compared to now, where he had his own. Of course, he had been told that he was not allowed to roam around in Kanaha in his original form, so he had to transform into a human. Not really his cup of tea, but if it meant he could have freedom, then so be it. However, not wanting to lose the power he had over those who wished to manipulate him, he retained several supernatural features, just to scare them off. Uzumaki Ino, on the other hand, thought he was adorable. He had tried to convince her otherwise, but she just laughed him off and patted his cheek like he was a little boy. Ridiculous woman. 
Speaking of the woman, she was currently seated at Naruto's bedside, knitting another SC Earth. She had 20 in her collection now and her obsession was starting to border on insanity. At least that's how Karama perceived it. She'd even offered to make one for him which he politely declined. Biju didn't wear scarves. Ino suddenly gasped and looked up, her blue eyes wide. Karama, who was seated by the window, turned around, worried that perhaps something had happened to Naruto, but instead he found Ino hunched over, her arms circled around her bulging stomach. What's wrong with you, woman? Karama asked. He had observed her from inside of Naruto for years, even when they were only little annoying brats in the academy, but he had to admit, he didn't actually know her that well. Was she trying to get his attention or something? Ino gave him a very dirty look, one he recognized. He had seen it on a woman's face before, just once, when Kushina had gone into labor all those years ago. Oh, for goodness sake, now. Karama asked. Hey, it's not like I can say, don't come now baby. Ino yelled back. Karama sighed and stood to press the call button above Naruto's head. He knew the nurses would probably come running, expecting some change with Naruto, only to find his wife in labor, but he was not a doctor or a midwife and there was no way he was going to handle a woman while she's giving birth. He had to go through it with two of his former Jinchuriki in the past, he didn't really fancy ever doing it again. But as the fates would have it, when the nurses did arrive and helped Ino into a wheelchair so they could escort her to the maternity ward, she grabbed his hand and he was forced to go with her. Bloody hell the woman had a death grip. And so Izumaki Kaguya was born. Her name was a sore spot for Karama, not because he had known Hagoromo's mother personally, but the former sage had told them of her, the brave woman who ate the forbidden fruit from the god tree and was the first human to have chakra as a result. When Karama heard the name Kaguya, his memories ultimately went back to the days where he was a newly created entity, a small portion of the whole, the Juabi. And he missed those days, back then humans didn't really know of him, he had freedom and he didn't have to be good. Now there were rules and greedy individuals who just wanted to abuse him. Of course, Ino chose the name Kaguya for a completely different reason. She whispered the tale of the bamboo cutter to the newborn babe with blonde curls with a large smile on her face. Motherhood suited the woman well, Karama had to admit. But as he glanced at his squashed fingers he idly wondered if they would ever recover from the abuse they had received from the blonde woman's grasp. Probably not. Next time Naruto decided to knock up his wife, Karama will be staying far far away. Thank you, Ino's voice shook Karama from his reverie. Kaguya was now attached to Ino's bosom, and the woman was staring at him, same large smile still on her face. Karama raised an eyebrow. For what? He asked. For being here, Ino replied. Naruto couldn't be, but he will be so happy to know you were. Not like I had a choice, Karama shrugged. Ino chuckled and looked down at her daughter again. Do you want to hold her? Ino asked. No, Karama said very quickly, maybe too quickly. He cleared his throat. I mean... Would you really want your daughter to be held by me? Of course, Ino laughed. You are our friend. Karama blinked. He had not been aware that Ino considered him a friend. For two weeks he had stayed with her, because her husband could not. And during those two weeks he ever only had bonding time as she called it about twice, when he helped her up and down the stairs and when he escorted her to the hospital twice a day to visit Naruto. They rarely spoke outside of those times, Karama preferred to lock himself up in the guest room while Ino lay on her bed and knitted scarves and little socks and all kinds of other creepy yarn items. So a friendship was not what he would call their relationship. Ino must have read his mind, because she chuckled. Any person Naruto deems worthy of being called a friend, is a friend of mine. If he were human, Karama was certain he would have blushed. But alas, he was not, so no blushing today. But he gave Ino a small smile. He liked her, despite the fact that she very nearly just broke all his fingers under an hour ago. She was warm and radiant, with a smile that could rival her husband's. She stood firmly for justice and was very intelligent, having graduated with top marks after Uchiha Sasuke and Abura Meshino. She loved taking care of others and she never took no for an answer. It was such a pity that some people had come to view her as shallow and greedy, all because of how she dressed, 
which was for comfort, and because she sometimes felt overshadowed by her companions, Harano Sakura in particular. Yes, Naruto had chosen his life companion well. A knock on the door interrupted the precious moment between newborn, mother and the beast. Ino didn't even have a chance to invite the person in before the door was knocked down and almost the whole of Kanaha stormed in. News of Kaguya's birth had spread quickly, and all of Ino's friends and family had come to welcome the new addition to the world. Yamanaka Inoichi, a proud new grandfather, was crying his eyes out as Ino handed the baby to him. His wife, Mrs. Yamanaka, and Hyuga Hinata both stood by his side, mesmerized by the newborn's face. While everyone was distracted by the baby and congratulating Ino, Hatake Kakashi stepped up next to Karama. His daughter, Kana, was staring at Karama with big eyes, at the age of five, she was not aware of who or what he was, but his pointy ears and vermilion hair and eyes must have put her on edge. She was, after all, just as intelligent as her father, or so many claimed. Still here, then? Kakashi asked, his gaze focused on Ino and the baby. I am not leaving until Naruto awakens, Karama replied. Scared that you have killed him? No, but it is what a friend would do. The corners of Kakashi's lips quirked up. I will never get used to you using that word. Your friendship with Naruto saved us. Karama shook his head. No, he saved me. And not just me, all nine of us. Not one of the Biju are tied to a country now, we are all free to do as we please, as long as we don't harm humans. And our freedom would never have been possible if it weren't for that boy. Kakashi's facial expression suddenly turned stony. I came to warn you, actually. Karama raised an eyebrow, but since Kakashi had lowered his voice, Karama assumed he should not visibly overreact, because Kakashi clearly did not want the others to hear. Warn me against what? There are people who don't like the fact that you are now free, Kakashi whispered. Karama smirked. Oh, I know. But that's the thing isn't it? There will always be someone who hates me. And there was one person who was very verbal when it came to her opinion that the Biju should have stayed where they were, sealed inside of a Jinchura key so that they could be controlled and manipulated. Her name? Shimura Ayaka. Karama did not find her intimidating, in fact, her small frail build made her look more like the damsel in distress than the big bad wolf. But she was the niece of a very old notorious man and her belief in him was strong. Even if he was dead, the stupid old fool had gotten himself killed trying to become the sixth Hokage and ultimately the leader of the allied shinobi forces. Karama wasn't sure whether Ayaka had inherited more of Danzo's intelligence or his stupidity. Perhaps a bit of both. Kana tugged on her father's trousers, indicating she wanted to be picked up. Kakashi complied and lifted her into his arms. Her dark eyes stared straight at Karama, piercing through him. Oh she was intelligent all right, he could feel it in the way she scrutinized him. You're a fox, she stated, her voice young but assured. I am, Karama replied. Kana tilted her head to the side, then giggled, surprising not only her father, but the fox himself. Karama was tempted to ask what she found funny, but a movement in the doorway caught his eye. He frowned, excused himself and slipped outside. Kakashi watched him leave, weary. Kana, on the other hand, just kept giggling. Did your mother never teach you it is rude to eavesdrop? Karama asked once he stood alone in the sterile hallway of the maternity ward. A sigh echoed from around the corner, and with one step Shimura Ayaka revealed herself. Her brunette hair was tied up in a bun, her dark eyes shone with determination, but her posture betrayed her. She was nervous and he could not only feel it, he could see it. And what would you know of mothers? Ayaka retorted. You never had one. Touché, Karama snorted. What are you up to, Shimura? I'm simply keeping an eye on you, that is all, was Ayaka's response. Ah, how sweet, Karama taunted, doing what Uncle Danzo would have wanted. Ayaka's eyes narrowed dangerously and her lips pursed into a thin line. It was a mistake to free you and the other biju. Uzumaki Naruto is a fool, and I can't sit back and let him destroy Kanaha. Karama rolled his eyes. Can I use the phrase, apple doesn't fall far from the tree if it concerns a niece and uncle? Because this all sounds familiar and is starting to give me an earache. Watch your tongue, demon. 
No, Kurama barked as he stepped closer to Ayaka that he almost pressed against her. You watch your tongue, you silly little girl. Uzumaki Naruto is not a fool. If you want to get really technical about all the things he had done for this village, then at least once he has saved your life. You should be grateful he is trying to change things for the better, rather than holding on to old ways that are no longer valid or in the best interests of the people. What makes you think my way of thinking isn't in the people's best interest? Ayaka retorted. Because you're alone. Ayaka froze as he uttered those words, which caused Kurama to smirk. He had hit home, really hard. Because that was just it, Ayaka was alone and the loneliness was killing her. But she was also proud, and therefore there was no way she was ever going to admit she was wrong or go back on her ways. It wasn't in her nature. Her stubbornness could be seen as her strength, but it was also her weakness. I am not alone, Ayaka muttered as she looked down at her feet. Really? Then where's your friends who support you? Where's the so-called people who feel the world should run like you want it to be run? Where is your precious ol' uncle, huh? He knew bringing up Danzo was a bad gamble, but he was having too much fun to care. Shimura Ayaka's trembling lips and glassy eyes was making him feel in control, like he has finally gotten back the power he had lost when Uchiha Madara had locked him in a cave. His satisfaction shattered when Ayaka looked up, determination burning in her eyes, despite the tears that threatened to flow. I promise you, I will find people who will follow me, Kurama, Ayaka stated. I will stand up to you and your precious Hokage, and then we'll see who the real boss is. And with that she turned around and stomped away, leaving the biju behind, shocked. For several minutes he thought she was serious, that she'd actually pull it off, but then he just laughed. There was no way she would get a strong force behind her. Oh, how wrong he was. Present day. Kurama was staring out the window, Naruto's story sinking in, but the silence was broken when Naruto cleared his throat. The fox turned around, surprised that the blonde had more to say, but he knew he shouldn't have been surprised, Naruto never shut up. Council and other village issues aside, Naruto sighed, there is also the Eno incident. Kurama wasn't sure whether he should be worried or happy that the woman, who he very clearly saw as a close friend, was mentioned. Judging by the exhausted expression on Naruto's face, Kurama assumed it should be a matter where worry was required. And while his concern increased as Naruto told the tale, he could also see the small hints of contentment on the blonde's face. So, the idiot had gone and fallen in love with the alternate version of his wife too, eh? Figures. Several years earlier. If Kurama thought Izumaki Ino was insane earlier, then he was solely mistaken, because labor had surely messed with the woman's head. Who in their right mind would leave a two-week-old baby in the care of a big bad fox? Of course, it hadn't been intentional. Eno had been feeding newborn Kaguya quietly when there was a call from the hospital. Eno had answered, listening to the speaker on the other side and promptly turned as white as a sheet. Kurama, of course, knew immediately that something had happened to Naruto. He offered to go, but Eno had declined and stated it was probably better if he stayed and took care of the baby. And so here he was, sitting in Naruto's living room, baby in arms. Kaguya was staring at him and chewing on her fist, which Kurama found extremely disgusting. Did all humans chew their fists? What on earth did it accomplish? He just did not understand and the only conclusion he could come to was that all human babies were cannibals. It was a logical explanation. Time ticked by, and the sun was starting to disappear beyond the horizon, and still no news from the hospital. Kurama was starting to worry, and Kaguya was becoming restless. An idle thought passed by and Kurama wondered if human babies were like ducks and named the first thing they saw their mother. Does that mean Kaguya thought he was her father because he had been the first male she saw? Suddenly he didn't feel all that enthusiastic about babysitting anymore, not that he was in the first place. Nope, he was going to the hospital, with baby, and all. He would never forget the stares he received all the way through the streets. It wasn't every day you saw a biju with a baby, so those silly humans better have burned the image into their retinas. As it turns out, Naruto had entered cardiac arrest, completely out of the blue. His vitals had been fine one minute, and then boom. Heart failure and the works. Ino was hysterical and she started screaming like a banshee when she saw Karama with Kaguya in the hallway. 
You were supposed to stay home. She shrieked. No way, Karama argued. I am not your babysitter, take your baby and leave me out of it. Eno pursed her lips, her eyes were glassy. Karama knew she was about to burst into tears, so he stashed Kaguya into her arms. Eno looked into her daughter's eyes and smiled weakly. She looks like him, she muttered. Yeah, she sort of does, Karama agreed. How is he? Stable, but they don't know what's going on yet, Eno replied. I'm scared, Karama, what if he dies? He won't, Karama argued. Not when he knows there's you, and Kaguya. Eno's weak smile widened slightly as a few tears escaped from her eyes. The door behind them swung open and Tsunade walked out. Eno and Karama studied her closely for any signs, but the woman had her poker face on, much to their frustration. Is he okay? Eno asked timidly, very unlike her, but she was an emotional wreck right now, so Karama did not blame her. Tsunade stared emotionlessly at Eno for several seconds, making the air tense, and then she smiled, warm and open and so very Tsunade. See for yourself, Tsunade said just before she stepped aside to allow them access to the room. Eno and Karama glanced at each other, then together they stepped inside and was met by a pair of familiar blue eyes they both had come to love very deeply, in different ways, of course. It was quiet their reunion. For a long time the three adults just stared at each other, while Kaguya gurgled and reached out to the strange, but somewhat familiar man in the hospital bed. Naruto's first words as a non-Jinchuriki was, What? I missed her birth. Despite his initial annoyance at being in a coma during Kaguya's birth, the minute the blonde babe was placed in his arms, it all melted away. Naruto grinned as Kaguya waved her tiny arms above her. We make awesome babies together, Eno, he commented, causing the blonde woman to blush a deep red. Her husband gave her a wink in return. Meanwhile, Karama was trying not to gag. Humans were so mushy. Naruto stared at his daughter, amazed at the miracle of life. His gaze shifted to Ino and he smiled. She was beautiful, even with her much more rounded figure because of pregnancy. He knew she would probably work it all off, but in his opinion, she was fine just the way she was. Kaguya gurgled and patted one of her arms against her father's chest, catching his attention. He looked down at her again, amazed to see her smiling, if it could be called a smile since she had no teeth. Oh she was beautiful and he knew that one day he definitely wanted more. Thank you, Eno, Naruto whispered, surprising both the blonde and the fox that stood by the window. For what? Eno asked. For everything, was the soft response. Eno felt tears forming, although she had no idea why. With a small laugh she sat down on her husband's bed and wrapped her arms around him. You're very welcome, she replied with tears rolling down her cheeks. Karama observed them, then turned his attention back out the window a smirk on his lips. Well, Minato, it looks like Naruto found his Kushina. Although her punches are not as painful, thank the gods. Present day. Sasuke and Suijitsu stood close together in a small alleyway just outside Hyuga Astra's shop. They had followed the coordinates on Karen's fake mission scroll, and were both surprised it led here. The two exchanged glances, then turned their attention to the awfully quiet building. No one appeared to be home because the windows were shut and the curtains drawn. But they were still cautious, because this is where Karen went missing, so anything could happen. I knew that woman was fishy, Suijitsu muttered. Sasuke raised an eyebrow and tilted his head, motioning for Suijitsu to elaborate. What? Suijitsu asked, don't you think her sudden appearance into everyone's lives was just that, sudden? She's been here for years, Suijitsu, Sasuke argued. Karen comes here all the time to buy dresses. Yes, she's been coming to this building to buy dresses for years, Suijitsu agreed, but I don't remember it always belonging to Hyuga Astra. What kind of name is Astra, anyway? Sasuke frowned, trying to put the pieces together, but he just could not remember anything about the shop prior to Hyuga Astra taking control of it, and that was easily a decade ago. You're not drunk, are you? Sasuke asked. No, I don't do alcohol, remember? Suijitsu retorted. It dehydrates me very quickly. But that's beside the point, Sasuke, 
Do you seriously not remember anything about this place before Hyuga? Sasuke shook his head. No, she took over ten years ago, before then the place was locked up. Suijitsu stared at his friend, eyes wide. Uh, no, Hyuga Astra took over a few months ago, before that the shop belonged to some old woman. Sasuke blinked. Suijitsu blinked back. And then it clicked. You don't think? Suijitsu asked. Sasuke nodded. Mind manipulation, has to be. Hyuga Astra is not who she says she is at all and she's planted seeds into our heads. Wonder why it didn't work on you. Maybe I'm very fluid. Sasuke rolled his eyes. Now really wasn't the time for jokes. We have to report this to Naruto. Yeah, Suijitsu agreed, but that can happen after we've saved Karen. Sasuke wanted to argue, but his teacher's old words echoed through his mind. He scowled, of all times to remember the past, did it have to be now? With a nod, Sasuke and Suijitsu jumped onto the roof to check the surroundings, before they both jumped down into the back garden. They exchanged glances, then both kicked the door down. They were going to find their teammate, even if it meant luring the shark to the bait, because that is what teamwork meant. Those who break the rules are trash. But those who abandon their comrades are even worse than trash. With 37-year-old Ino. Ino did not know what to expect when she arrived in Sunagakur. She knew Gara had gotten her message, the Kyubi had been very adamant about that, but that is not what worried her. No, she was more worried about what kind of person Gara in this universe was. Was he like the one she knew back in her dimension, quiet and diplomatic, with a good head on his shoulders? Or was he more like when he was in his youth, dark, gloomy, and mysterious? Or maybe he was none of the above and a completely different person. And then there was the topic of his gift. Was he aware of it in this dimension? Did he know how to use it? Because if he didn't, Eno wasn't certain if he could be any help, but she had to try. Because the longer she tried to figure things out by herself, the more she realized that something was missing. Not in the sense that she couldn't figure it out, but rather like a chunk of memory was missing. There had been a sandstorm on the first day of her journey and while she took refuge in a cave she decided to meditate. And that was when she discovered there was something very wrong within her concees, her memory had been altered, or erased, she was not certain yet. But the empty space was there, she knew how her mind worked and she knew how memories and extracting worked, so she knew when there was something wrong. She had nearly kicked herself for not having noticed sooner. She called herself a Yamanaka, and yet she could not even pick up a manipulation of her own mind. But the discovery did provide one answer, the person behind this all definitely knew how to work around the mind. Eno worried that perhaps it was another of her clan, someone filled with petty jealousy and this was their revenge. But she couldn't quite see the motivation, so perhaps it wasn't a Yamanaka. But it was someone who knew how to manipulate memories, and someone who was able to decipher her notes on five dimensions to heaven. She really needed to get to Suna as soon as possible, because this person was definitely not in this dimension, and that meant Naruto and the other Ino was in danger. When Ino reached the large village gates to Sunagakur, she was met by a familiar face. Upon first inspection, Gara seemed quite normal. Ino watched him carefully, he had the same auburn hair, the same turquoise gaze, the same stature. Even his gait was the same, so Ino felt a sense of relief. Getting to know him would not be a challenge. So, how is the husband? Or so she thought. Eno blinked, surprised by the question. She glanced behind her, but there was no one there, so Gara was definitely addressing her. She had not told him anything about who she was or where she came from in advance, the only word she had exchanged with him was through Karama, and that was just one word, which should have given Gara a hint, but not enough to know her life story. The smirk on his face, however, made it very clear that he was very well aware of who she was. When Eno struggled to gather a response, the Kaze Kage chuckled under his breath, something Eno was not accustomed to, at least not on a Gara with such a young face. Even at 16, the Gara she knew had been rather, antisocial, not out of choice, but because he just didn't know how to communicate properly. Eno tilted her head to the side. Sabaku no Gara. Are you sporting a second personality under that facade of yours? The smirk on his lips did not fade, in fact it only seemed to grow. 
He also tilted his head to the side. Perhaps, Uzumaki Ino. The two stared at each other in silence, Ino out of shock, Gara out of amusement. How did you know I was not the Ino of this world? Ino broke the silence after several minutes. The same way I know there's a gap in your memory, was the response. Ino was momentarily confused, and then slowly it sunk in and her eyes widened. Oh my god, you're telepathic. All right, that shouldn't have been a surprise. Gara, her Gara, Hinata's Gara was also telepathic, but not on a large scale. He could only read the minds of Biju and communicate with them, that was his limit. But this Gara, young Gara, he could read the minds of humans as well. Yes, I can read your mind, Gara stated. What do you mean, Hinata's Gara? Ino opened her mouth to explain, but he cut her short. Ah, we're married. Fascinating. Keep out of my head. Ino shrieked, feeling very violated. Not until you apologize for calling me a psychic. You know me in another dimension, so you should know I hate Dash. The word, Eno finished for him with a smile. I know. Gara nodded. What other surprises do you have hidden under that fake emotionless mask of yours? Eno asked. Whatever do you mean? I don't know, you don't seem like the Gara that got described to me. And who described me? Naruto, of course. Hmm, <laughs> yes, he is one of the majority that has not witnessed my other personality, as you put it. Has your siblings seen it? No. When I was a child, I told to marry I cold hear her speak without her mouth moving, and she told me to shut up and never mention it again. So I didn't. Eno felt saddened by that. Poor Gara, like so many others that were different, he had to hide it, because the fear of the unknown made others do silly things. Well, you have certainly surprised me, Lord Kaze Kage, Eno chuckled. I suppose I do not have to explain why I am here. No, Gara replied. And I have already figured out how to regain your lost memory. Eno was stunned. Gara stepped aside, allowing her space to enter through the village gates. Eno stepped past him and grinned. Well, we better get started then. Chapter 35, Insanity Suijitsu felt uneasy. He could not describe the heavy dread that settled in his stomach as Sasuke Minerva read around the room, both of them alert. The air was heavy, and something smelt unattractively sweet, like honey mixed with some sort of heavy spice. Deep within his gut, Suijitsu got the feeling that it wasn't Hyuga Astra's perfume that permeated the air. Smell that? Suijitsu asked. No, was Sasuke's curt reply, just as the Uchiha came to stand still before a painting pinned to the wall. Suijitsu hopped over, and both men stared at the painting in absolute shock. I told ya this woman was a nutter, Suijitsu grumbled. She's messed with our heads, or well, yours. Sasuke grunted, his focus shifting to the various scribbles on the walls. He could not decipher them, and all the mess reminded him of was a psychiatric patient that scratched their madness onto walls. A sense of dizziness overcame him, and he had to shake his head to regain his balance. The writing on the wall suddenly seemed blurry. And then Suijitsu collapsed onto the ground in a heap. Funny, Sasuke grumbled. Get up, Suijitsu. But Suijitsu did not respond. Sasuke sighed and kicked the white-haired man's legs, but still no response. Annoyed, he got onto his knees, ready to pummel the stupid bastard. Now was not the time to play silly games, Karen was danger but just Sasuke felt his knees make contact with the wooden floor, the dizziness increased, and before he knew it everything went black. Kurama had made the decision to share what he knew regarding Shimura Ayaka, and how she had promised him she would gain power and overthrow Naruto. Naruto listened to his story with rapt attention, his finger delicately tapping his chin in thought. When Kurama concluded his retelling, Naruto sighed. Why is there always someone who can't fit inside the box? Nobody ever fits inside the box, Naruto. Your way of thinking is far different from your predecessors and some of the radical changes you made makes Shimura feel threatened, Kurama replied. What radical changes? Naruto asked. The other biju and your freedom was a long time coming. Kurama smiled softy at the confession. And we are grateful for it. 
But that wasn't the only changes you made, and one of your changes has now become Shimura's tool to bite you back. Naruto clicked his tongue as he swiveled in his chair to overlook the village from the window. The High Council was never meant to gain any power over the law. I know, Karama responded. You recommended the introduction of the High Council to the Daimyo for them to act as your advisors and to represent the people to balance the power. It was a good proposal, Naruto, and has served the village well. But something is astray here, and somehow they have become corrupt and are no longer responsible or representative of the village. By astray you mean Ayaka is trying to take control? Naruto queried. Well, yes, but we both know she does not have the power, nor the resources to control the entire High Council alone. There's another factor, someone else in the picture perhaps. Naruto suddenly shot up from his seat as Karama's words sunk in. Control. Say what? Naruto spun around to look his friend in the eye. That's exactly what it is, someone has used mind manipulation to control the actions of the High Council. Karama frowned. It was a sound theory, and made the most sense. The members of the High Council were all elected by their clans or the people they represented, and were loyal to Naruto. There was no possible way they could ever have been convinced to turn against him, not with the level of loyalty they had shown before. So, to have such a complete turnover, mind manipulation made the most sense. But Shimura Ayaka had no such power, and Karama could not think of a single member of the Yamanaka clan who would use their abilities for such dark purposes. So it had to be someone else trained in the art, but who? Would you like me to snoop around, find evidence that this is the case? Karama asked. Is that why you summoned me? Naruto's brow furrowed, deep in thought. Truthfully, he had only summoned Karama to make the High Council quiver in their seats a bit. But now that the fox was here, it would be good to utilize his skills. Yes, that would be good, Naruto replied. But I have another request as well. Karama quirked an eyebrow, intrigued. Naruto shuffled through some paperwork and finally pulled out a map of the village, a big red dot clearly marking a location in the shopping district. He handed it to Karama and sat down, arms crossed. Binako warned me of a foreign chakra residing at that location, Naruto explained. Apparently it is similar to the disrupted chakra flowing through Eno since the transfer of dimensions. I want you to investigate and report any findings. Interesting, Karama hummed. And if I find the owner of this chakra? Arrest them, Naruto stated. I think it's time I have a little chat with this person. Karama nodded. I'll leave now. Mind if I swing around later to see the kids? Kaguya is on a mission, but Minato will be very happy to see you. Karama nodded and disappeared in a cloud of smoke. The earth was shaking. Why and how, Suijitsu was not certain of, but something was not right. The world around him was surrounded in darkness, his senses all cut off. He could not see or smell a thing. He was engulfed in a deep black sea. And all he could sense was the feeling of being shaken. Wake up. A voice echoed around him, followed by a stinging sensation in his cheek. Suijitsu blinked, now even more confused. Let me, another voice said, and the stinging sensation, which now felt like a small heated fire, moved from his cheek to his stomach. That seemed to send a jolt through him, and suddenly Suijitsu found himself sitting up, the darkness gone and in its place was the light from windows and two faces that belonged Uchiha Sasuke and, the Kyuubi? What happened? Suijitsu mumbled as he blinked rapidly to get accustomed to the light. We are still at Hyuga Astra's house, Sasuke stated. We passed out. Eh, how did we, two Jonin level shinobi, manage that? Suijitsu demanded. Had he seriously lost conceousness? He couldn't remember. It's a herb, Karama stated as he lifted himself from his crouching position and moved around the room. He sniffed the air. It's similar to valerian root, but was specially cultivated by botanists to induce a coma-like state with the senses of smell and sight cut off. Suijitsu pulled a face. And how did Sasuke and I get exposed to this herb? Karama came to a halt before the painting of Naruto, Hinata, and Astra. He stared at it in silence, his expression blank. He then turned to face Sasuke and Suijitsu. This Hyuga woman burns it like incense. I can smell it all through the house. 
You better get out of here. Sweejitsu grumbled. Well, that explains the disgustingly sweet smell I got a whiff of when we got here. No. Sasuke grunted, completely ignoring Sweejitsu's comment. I am not leaving until I find my wife. She's in the basement, Kurama stated, his eyes darting to the door that led to the front of the house. I can sense her emotions. But this herb is dangerous, I was able to wake you up with a shock from my chakra, but I can't protect you from its effects. Go, I'll get your wife. Sasuke clenched his fists, the anger boiling beneath the surface of his skin. The damned fox had no right to order him around, not when Karen was involved, but he also knew that Kurama had a point. With that in mind, Sasuke inhaled deeply to calm himself, then nodded slowly. However, just as he turned to Suijitsu so they can leave, a noise echoed through the house. Kurama clicked his tongue. Looks like the owner of the house is back. I can't sense her chakra, Sasuke muttered, which was unusual even for him. Sasuke and Suijitsu glanced at each other, a silent message passing between them. Suijitsu nodded and pulled a flask from his hip. He would need some hydration if a fight was to break out. Sasuke turned his attention back to Kurama. Kurama seemed to sense what the Uchiha wanted to ask, and he nodded in response. I'll get your wife, Kurama whispered. I'm immune to the herb, so I can move freely around the house. Naruto wants the Hyuga woman in custody, so I'll leave her capture to you. Sasuke nodded. That was exactly what he was going to suggest. Kurama slipped to the doorway and pressed himself against the wall. He listened carefully to Astra's movements, she seemed to be busy in the kitchen. Sasuke and Suijitsu were whispering how they would distract Astra and get her outside so they can escape from the herb's effects. After a plan was formulated, they dispersed, leaving Kurama alone. The sound of Astra's shoes meeting the wooden floors echoed through the house. She seemed to be unaware of the unwanted guests in her house, but Kurama concluded that was due to Sasuke and Suijitsu being intelligent enough to mask their chakra like he did. Or, perhaps, she was aware of their presence and was just taking her time in confronting them. He could hear cutlery brush together now, which meant she was rummaging through drawers. He knew he could not dawdle, the supposed cutlery could be kunai instead, and could mean the woman was onto them. He quickly slipped down the hall and into the small alcove that led to the basement. He was not familiar with the layout of the house, but the Uchiha's wife's emotions was his guide. The door's lock was a simple dead bolt, and was easily broken without making a sound. He quietly slipped down the stairs and into the large basement. Uchiha Karen looked extremely pale, her skin was as white as milk. Her rich red hair had no life to it and her wrists were chained to the wall. While she looked exhausted, she did not look ill, at least the Hyuga woman had made sure the redhead got some sustenance. Her piercing red gaze was locked onto him and for a minute he wondered why she looked so calm and then he remembered that she was an advanced sensor, and probably had been aware of his presence from the beginning. He did not utter a word and simply rented the shackles around her wrists in half. She stood up, but stumbled from weakness. He quickly steadied her, and motioned for her to be quiet, which earned him a glare. They both listened to the movement above. Astra had moved from the kitchen and was now in the bedroom. From her calm movements, it could be assumed Sasuke and Suijitsu was yet to make a move. Kurama turned to Karen and explained how they would sneak upstairs and escape through the front door. Astra is a sensor, Karen explained. She knows you're here, she's planning something, hence why she hasn't attacked. Kurama frowned. Then in the event she attacks, you escape and leave me behind. Karen blanched. You would do that? For a lowly human. Don't get me started on the human debate, Kurama groaned. Karen chuckled softly, and oddly it reminded him of Yoko's soft melodic laugh. He made a mental note to introduce the two women sometime in the future, he had a feeling they would get along swimmingly. Kurama and Karen slowly made their way up the stairs, Kurama making sure to stay close to Karen to support her if she felt dizzy. The herb's effect was still potent, and could kick in at any moment. They made it to the hallway, where they both hid behind a wall and listened for Astra's movements. Karen frowned when she heard small soft whimpers and whispers coming from the bedroom. Is she talking to someone? Karen asked, keeping her voice low. No, she's alone, Karama responded. 
I have a feeling this woman has a few loose screws in her head. That's rude, Karen huffed. Karama rolled his eyes, but his gaze quickly turned very serious. Karen blinked at the rapid change. What is it? She dared to ask. She's talking to herself, but she keeps saying Eno, Karama replied, his brow furrowed as he concentrated. Yeah, Karen hummed. Eno's her target. This alarmed Karama, and he knew he better get this news to Naruto as soon as possible. He motioned for Karen to slip from the little alcove they were hidden into the door that led to the front of the house, which he believed was the shop area. Karen nodded and quickly crept down the hallway. Astra did not make a move and remained pacing in her bedroom, the name Eno continuing to slip from her lips. Either she was waiting for an opportune moment, or she was so distracted by her insanity that she didn't notice her unwanted guests were on the move. Just as Karama was ready to join Karen, a loud crack echoed through the house. He froze, expecting Astra to react. React she did, but not to his presence. She cursed loudly, and he heard the back door that led outside slam. He waited a few seconds, and when he heard two kunai blades clash he knew Sasuke and Suijitsu had made their move. He quickly joined Karen, and the two escaped through the front door. The escape had been surprisingly easy, but the herb's effects were taking a toll on Karen. She collapsed once they were outside, and Karama quickly scooped her into his arms and disappeared into a puff of smoke. He only trusted one woman to help without asking too many questions. He just hoped this younger version of Ino knew medical ninjutsu. The house was quiet without Kaguya, and Minato was very vocal about it. He missed his sister, and had thrown a tantrum that morning before school. It took the whole morning to calm him down, and a bribe with chocolate cake and a new toy later had finally calmed him down. Ino had sighed in relief. She had never expected children to be such a hassle. She was angry that she had to bribe him though, and promised herself she would never do it again. After dropping Minato off at school, Ino had spent the rest of the morning and a portion of the afternoon at work, where Kana had reported that a garden bed had died. The whole five hours she had spent at work had been spent on cleaning out the garden, and completely refilling it with fresh soil, fertilizer, and replanting the plants that had perished. They were still uncertain what had caused the plants to die, but they all assumed something strange must have gotten into the soil. She then had to write a report for the hospital, explaining that there might be shortage in some medicinal herbs due to the incident. She had received a prompt reply from the director, who was more than content with getting the herbs from an external supply in the meantime. Eno returned home utterly exhausted. After brewing herself a cup of tea and settling on the couch, she dived into the pile of letters that had arrived in the mail. Most of them were bills, completely boring and of no interest. And then she found a letter with familiar cursive writing, the return address from Nade's Hiko village. She grinned and quickly ripped the envelope open, happy to see that Shizuka had once again responded to her letters. Salutations Eno. Thank you once again for your letter. It was good to hear more news of Jugo and how he is faring. Kazumi is most anxious to meet him and I must admit, I am also getting restless. I understand that time is always an issue, especially for someone such as yourself, but I was wondering if we could be a bother and come by next week. I am more than content at staying at a inn, for I do not wish to intrude. However, I would very much like it if we share stories over some tea during our visit. I am quite excited at the prospect of meeting you. I shall await your answer patiently. Shizuka of Nades Hiko. Ino quickly jumped up and skipped to the study, where she settled at her desk and wrote her responded to Shizuka. Once it was completed, she pocketed the envelope, locked the house and made her way to the post office. She passed the letter to one of the messengers who was picking up mail to deliver and quickly slipped to the cafe next door to buy a coffee. On her way home, Eno was greeted by some of the villagers, an occurrence she was now accustomed to. She greeted them all in return, and even played catch with a group of children for a few minutes. By the time she was nearing home, it was already time to fetch Minato from school, so she made sure to stop by there first. Mama! The little boy exclaimed when he spotted his mother. He jumped into her arms, and she swung him around as he laughed heartily. They walked home hand in hand, and Eno bought him a chocolate crepe, insisting it was in place of the cake she had promised him earlier. He accepted it without argument. 
Eno felt content, and knew that this is what she wanted her life to be like. Of course, back home she would also be a kunoichi, but she wanted to marry a man like Naruto, have children, and spoil them. She wanted to laugh and cry with them, and just enjoy the peaceful moments of life. Eno's feeling of contentment evaporated into thin air when she noticed that the front door to the house was open. Minato had let go of her hand and skipped to the house, but she quickly pulled him back, her senses alert. Mama. Minato asked, curious when he realized his mother looked angry. Shush, she ordered and he obeyed. Eno debated whether she should investigate or flee to ensure Minato's safety. As she debated the options in her head, a figure had come to stand in the doorway and Minato was the first to spot him. Karama. The little boy exclaimed, a broad smile on his face. The fox grinned in return, and Minato struggled from his mother's grip. She gasped when he slipped away, and was horrified when the boy jumped into the strange, animal-like man's arms. Karama? Where had she heard that name before? Once Minato had squeezed the life out of Karama, the fox put the little boy down, and his vermilion gaze shifted to the blonde woman. He scrutinized her, she didn't look any different, but her chakra was erratic and nowhere near what he had felt from her before. Her emotions were also erratic, fear and anger being the most dominant of them all. Calm yourself, woman, Karama ordered. I mean no harm to you. Eno scoffed and crossed her arms. Who are you? Karama was not surprised that she did not know, so he answered her calmly. I am Karama. Although you probably know me as the Kyubi. Eno blinked, and then the shock settled in. She stared at the man before her, trying to come to terms with the fact that the man, and boy was he a man, was actually a fox, a giant fox with nine tails, a wild temper and a habit of destroying things. Can Karama play with me? Minato asked, completely oblivious to his mother's reaction towards the fox. Not now, kid, Karama replied as he looked down at the little boy. I have to talk to your mom. We can play later. Go do your homework. Minato pouted, but did as he was told and disappeared into the house. Karama turned his attention back to Eno. Karen is inside. She has minor injuries and has been drugged. I can't take her to the hospital because it might alert the High Council, so please check her over. Eno nodded, dumbfounded. She followed the fox inside to help her friend. While Eno treated Karen's wounds, which were really just scratches and some skin irritation from the handcuffs, Karama explained what had happened. Hyuga Astra had kidnapped Karen, the reason still unknown, and Suijitsu and Sasuke should have her in custody by now. He also told Eno of the drug, who as a botanist, immediately recognized it. That herb was developed in Sunagakur during the Second Shinobi War and the Kaze Kage deemed it too dangerous for use, so the seedlings were destroyed. How on earth did she get her hands on it? Eno demanded. Karama shrugged. Karen had been quiet during the whole exchange, but Eno could tell something was bothering her. Are you okay? Eno asked, but she kicked herself the minute the words left her mouth. Of course the woman was not okay, she had been kidnapped and kept prisoner. Eno shook her head. I'm sorry, that was a stupid question. Karen smiled weakly. It's alright. But I'd like to see Naruto as soon as possible, I need to tell him what I learned while captured. Karama nodded. Yes, that is important, but it would be unwise for you to travel unwell. I'm fine, Karen hissed. We need to go now. Astra knows how to manipulate minds. And she is not working alone, so even if she is captured, her accomplice is still out there. Karama did not look at all surprised at the revelation that Astra had an accomplice. He folded his hands together and looked Karen dead in the eyes. Is her accomplice Shimura Ayaka by any chance? Yes, Karen replied, surprised that he already knew. They have some sort of agreement. Astra brainwashes the High Council, while Ayaka provides Astra with a fake identification, backstory, and protection from the law. Why? Karama asked. Karen sighed. I don't fully understand it, and I don't want to repeat myself so take me to Naruto. Very well, Karama sighed. He moved to help Karen stand, but she pushed his help away and turned to Eno. You must come, Eno, Karen said. Me? Why? 
Eno asked, surprised. Because Hyuga Astra wants you. After making sure Minato was safe under the care of Hinata, Eno, Kurama, and Karen made their way to the Hokage's office. Karen immediately stated that Naruto wasn't in his office, and his chakra was in the basement of the building, along with Sasuke, Suiyajetsu, and what Karen now recognized as Astra's chakra. So they were successful, Kurama stated, more to himself than anybody else. They slowly made their way down to the basement, Eno's heartbeat getting more erratic with every step. She was anxious and also very, very confused. Why did Astra want her? What was the problem? Is this why Astra had treated her so badly? The basement was dark, the only light came from oil lamps that were mounted to the walls. Astra was tied to a chair, her normally neat and tidy dark hair was a wild mess around her head. Naruto stood before her, his arms crossed and his expression grim. He looked dangerous, and if she hadn't felt so confused and lost, Ino would have admired the regality that surrounded him. Sasuke and Suijitsu stood to Naruto's right, both sporting a few bruises and scratches, but overall they looked okay, which was a relief. To Naruto's left stood a stranger, a man Ino did not recognize and if it wasn't for his medic uniform, she would not have known he worked for Kanaha Hospital. How did you capture her? Kurama broke the silence. The four men turned to face the newcomers and Naruto looked surprised to see Ino with them. She smiled nervously at him, and he smiled reassuringly back, conveying the message that no harm would come to her if he was in the room and it made her feel safe. It was surprisingly easy, Suijitsu commented. She's a complete nutcase. My little explosion got her attention, and while she tried to put up a fight, she was so far lost in some sort of crazy fit that she could barely lift a blade. The medic cleared his throat, turning all attention to him. She is not a nutcase, he stated with a commanding tone. She is a victim of several mental disorders, at least that is my hypothesis. I can't diagnose her without proper tests. While the others looked at him with blank faces, Eno understood what he was and why was present. He obviously worked in the psychiatric ward, and would have been called when Naruto determined Astra was not sound of mind. At this revelation, Eno turned her attention to the woman tied to the chair, looking for any sign of madness, for it was never there before. But, indeed, something had snapped in Astra. Her hair had become a wild mane, her eyes wild with a darkness that hadn't been there before. Gone was her calm, mysterious and moody disposition and in its place sat a monster, a beast that bared its teeth once Eno met her gaze. Astra shrieked and struggled against the ropes that bound her to the chair, her voice echoing through the basement. It sent a shiver down Eno's spine and genuinely made her wonder what it was that could make such an aloof woman suddenly become so wild with maddening passion. What happened to her? Eno breathed, her heart beating wildly against her ribcage. She was perfectly normal the last time I saw her. We do not know, Naruto admitted. Nobu here believes she has struggled with her mental health for a while, but was able to gain some sense of control over her life, but something must have made her snap. The medic nodded. The Hokage is correct. But, once again, I cannot say for certain until I have conducted tests. Lord Hokage, I implore you, delay your interrogation. She is unsound of mind, and by law that means she should be treated first. Naruto sighed and rubbed his temples. Yes, yes, I know. But she keeps saying my wife's name and I want to know why. Ino was the woman who raised her, Karen interrupted. All eyes turned to her. Uh, what? Eno asked, not expecting that answer. Karen sighed. Astra is from another dimension, separate from this one and yours, Eno. Suijitsu looked confused, but he decided not to interrupt to ask what his teammate meant by different dimension, he was certain if he listened he would come to understand. Karen continued her story, I saw some snippets of her life before she came here through her use of mind manipulation. It was horrible, her dimension is buried in war and the Hokage is selected through a bloody battle to the death. Yamanaka Ino was a tyrant who challenged the previous Hokage, Astra's father, and, won. Silence followed, and as the information settled, realization struck Sasuke, Suijitsu, and Kurama. The painting in Astra's bedroom, her father, their gazes shifted to Naruto. Naruto noticed and frowned. What? He asked. You're her father, Naruto, 
Karama stated. There's a painting in her bedroom, of her as an infant with Hinata, who is obviously her mother and, you. Naruto blinked, and then his gaze shifted to Astra, who was still struggling to free herself from her bonds. She is my daughter. Naruto echoed. Karama nodded. Naruto's frown deepened. Okay, so she's my daughter from another dimension. I still don't understand, why is she here? And what does she want with Eno, who is obviously not the tyrant from her dimension? I'm not entirely certain, Karen admitted. I only overheard her talking with Ayaka once, but Astra came here with the five dimensions to heaven. Remember that time Eno, our Eno I mean, had attempted to use it in another conciousness bled through into hers. Naruto nodded. He would never forget the time he feared for his wife's life. That conciousness was Astra, Karen pointed out. Astra had found a way to reverse the technique as she sifted through Eno's memories, which inevitability saved Eno's life, but it also meant Astra knew everything about the five dimensions to heaven and in her anger and despair, she decided to complete the technique and escape her horrible life. But, Suijitsu interrupted. That's good, isn't it? She just wanted to escape? I would have done the same thing. Karen nodded. I know. Apparently, despite the fact that Astra had been able to separate herself from Eno's conciousness, a link remained between them. When Astra activated the technique, Eno was pulled into it, and in her attempt to try and reverse it, it backfired and that is how we ended up with younger Eno here. A strange sensation washed over Eno as the explanation for why she had ended up in this dimension finally came to the surface. Naruto also seemed relieved, but he only visibly relaxed for a second before being on alert again. He moved closer to Eno and wrapped his arm around her shoulder, giving it a comforting squeeze. Now that they knew how she got here properly, they could work out how to get her back. Not all had been explained yet, but it was a start. Now they just needed to hear Astra's side of the story, to find out why she had lied to them all, why she had tampered with their memories of her, for they all thought she was a villager that had been around for decades. Now they could determine why she had brainwashed the High Council for Shimura Ayaka, and what exactly she wanted with Eno. Things were finally looking brighter. And then Astra shrieked violently, her chair rattling as she struggled. Her fiery gaze settled on Eno and she hissed like a poisonous snake. And then, just like that, she calmed and tears started flowing down her pale cheeks. Why? She croaked, her voice hoarse. Why did you say that, Eno? Chapter 36, Hashiko Uzumaki Hashiko's only memory of her mother was of a cloudless night, the stars shining bright. Mother and daughter had settled in the damp grass, Hinata's warm motherly arms had held her steadily and she had hummed an old lullaby long forgotten by the people of the fire country. Hinata, that night, had promised Hashiko that soon her father would end the war. Soon there would finally be peace, and Hoziko would be able to live her life to the fullest. It seemed like a dream so far out of reach, but she found herself clinging to it, desiring it. She wanted this peace that she had only seen in books. She wanted to see this ideal world her parents so vigorously fought for. After her mother's death, Hashiko lost grasp of the dream. Her father had secluded himself from the world and shut himself in his office. She rarely saw him, and when she did, he smelt of stale ramen noodles and beer. An anxiety had settled within Hashiko and she became isolated from the other children. They didn't like her, she was weird. Sometimes, when exposed to certain events, she breathed abnormally and this scared the other children, for they did not understand that she had no control at times over her disorder. Her therapist constantly reminded her that the only way she would gain control, is if she believed in herself again. But how could she believe in herself if she didn't even believe in the world? Her life was bleak. She had no friends, and school was spent in solitude, usually in a dark corner where she lost herself in her books. Books were her only friends, her solace. And it was at the age of ten that the bane of her existence had noticed this. That is quite a thick book you got there. A voice, feminine, but filled a certain tone of danger, stated. Hashiko looked up into a pair of eyes so blue, it would put even her father's to shame. So. Hashiko had asked defiantly. So what if the book was thick? The woman smiled. At the time, 
Hashiko had been too young to understand that the smile wasn't genuine, so she had returned the smile, thinking the woman approved of her endeavor to read a volume so beyond her age. She did not see the woman again for several years, until she had challenged her father to a duel to the death. Strangely, Naruto had accepted without argument, despite his advisor's word against it. And so her father had met his fate, at the hands of the woman Hashiko only learned later had been his first lover. Yamanaka Ino was crowned Hokage, and by some sick twisted mind game, the woman had had the nerve to adopt Hashiko, effectively pulling her away from the Hyuga family's grasp and so Hanabi's help and little care vanished into thin air. Hashiko's anxiety worsened the years that followed. And that was not all, she started hearing voices, just little whispers, whom she had convinced herself belonged to her mother. Her mother was angry, her mother wanted her to kill Ino, that's what the voices said. And so Hashiko waited for the moment she would exact her revenge. She endured Ino's abuse, while secretly training, just like her father's relative, Karen, had done. Finally the day of her revenge had come. It was no secret that Ino's health had deteriorated as the years passed. Her strength was also slipping away, and yet nobody still had the nerve to challenge the Hokage. Most of Ino's rule had been that of tyranny, but there had been moments, acts that she had instilled that made the people fall at her feet and worship them. But Hashiko was no fool and she was not going to fall for such petty tricks. She challenged the woman to a duel to the death. She knew Ino would laugh in her face, she knew the woman would tell her, go home, little girl. Instead she was greeted with a tired acceptance. And as Hashiko drove her blade through Ino's chest, a mere ten minutes into battle, Ino smiled. Hashiko was already at the age of twenty by this time, and unlike the time when she was a child, she knew this smile was genuine. It was a smile of genuine sadness, filled with such despair, that Hashiko could not believe it came from Yamanaka Ino's face. And then, with a single tear slipping from her cheek, Ino embraced her and whispered, Forgive me, my little songbird. Those five words marked the end of Hashiko's sanity. For nothing made sense anymore. Her mother's whispers had faded and was replaced with Ino's whispers instead. Wherever Hashiko went, Ino followed. But this Ino wasn't cruel, and she never addressed Hashiko by name. No, this Ino had friends, a Kaguya and a Minato. Children, with hair as blonde as their mother's, and eyes as blue as their father's, her father's blue eyes. The four of them lived together in a large mansion, shared meals together and lived in a world of peace. Peace, the dream she had shared with her mother and never achieved. And as she watched them, she wanted it. She wanted a family, she wanted peace. The Eno in her head also whispered of darker things, of dimension traveling and expanding the power over invading other minds. Hashiko had studied the unusual all her life, so she listened and she memorized every word, every sentence. She realized Eno was getting ill, and while she hated the woman, a part of her felt pity for this angelic version of the bane of her existence. So she studied and found the tiger seal that Eno was missing and inserted it into the equation. Eno's whispers vanished from her mind, and Hashiko once again was alone, this time in a cell. But she had a new goal in life now. She was going to find a new life for herself, she was going to rewrite her own person. And Uzumaki Eno's five dimensions to heaven was going to be her tool. But before she could settle in a universe with her mother and father and have her happily ever after, she had one more task to do. It was the first and the last time she visited Yamanaka Ino's grave, where she found a letter enclosed in a box, entitled to her. It only had a few words. If you had been my daughter by blood, I never would have treated you the way I did. Her therapist's mantra echoed through her head as she reread the letter ten times, but the control would not come. She ripped the paper to shreds and in her anger, activated the technique that would bring her freedom. She never expected to come face to face with the Eno that had loved her children so dearly. Eno had tried to reverse the technique, in fear of the consequences. However, the force of it backfired, and Eno was sent spiraling into the wild unknown, exchanging her body with another. Hashiko ended up stranded in Uzumaki Eno's dimension, alone and with a bump to the head and the link she had to the blonde woman severed. She was found by a Shimura Ayaka, who took care of her. For a time, Hashiko was calm, her previous madness forgotten. With Ayaka's assistance, she was given a home, a job, and a history. 
But Ayaka had ulterior motives, and had threatened Hyuga Hinata's life if Hashiko did not brainwash the High Council, and continued to control their actions. Hashiko, who had missed her mother more than anything, did as she was told. For even if the woman in this dimension was not her mother, she was still Hinata. And for Hinata, she would do anything. The bump to her head had addled her memories somewhat, and all she could remember of Eno was that she was angry, and the woman had to pay. Eno had taken something from her, and she wanted it back. Months passed, and her memory slowly started to return, and with it the unexplainable anger. Hashiko, now going by the name Astra, made her dislike for Eno, this time a much younger Eno stuck in the body of an older one, quite clear. And as the anger festered, the voices returned and whispered little notions into her ear. Why should Eno always get her happy ending? Eno may have asked for forgiveness, but she didn't mean it. Kill her. The voices swept over Astra and had completely cut her from reality. She was so lost in the never-ending darkness that she didn't even realize the noise she had heard in the garden would be the downfall of her freedom. The strike to the back of her head effectively knocked her unconscious, and when she came to, she was met by the blank stares of her capturers, her father amongst them. But his presence was not the one that sent her into a wild fit of rage. Eno. Why was it always Eno? Why couldn't the woman leave her alone? Why? She croaked, her voice hoarse. Why did you say that, Eno? It was at that moment that Izumaki Hashiko, who had almost forgotten what her name sounded like on her own lips, realized that what Eno had taken from her was her childhood. Eno had killed her father, adopted her for some unknown reason and abused her. Eno hadn't taken anything physical, and the damage was done. Eno would not be able to give what she had taken back. Why did you ask for my forgiveness? Hashiko sobbed as she struggled against the ropes that bound her to the chair. Why did you look at me like you loved me, when I drove a sword through your heart? She did not receive a response, and rather it seemed like the group was ignoring her. The medic, a man she did not recognize turned to her father. Lord Hokage, please, the medic begged. Naruto nodded, and motioned for Kurama to untie the ropes that bound Hashiko to the chair. He did so, and lifted her into his arms with ease. He turned to the medic. Where are we taking her? Kurama asked. The medic gave directions to the fox, and then two of them vanished in puffs of smoke, leaving the rest behind. Sasuke sighed. And now we still don't know what it was that she wanted. We wouldn't have gotten anything out of her, Naruto responded. Let the medic take care of her. Let us worry about the High Council. Speaking of, what are you planning to do regarding Shimura? Karen asked. Sasuke glanced at his wife, worry evident on his features, but she just smiled at him. He did not return the smile, but he took her hand in his and squeezed tightly. He was relieved that she was safe and unharmed. Are you planning to arrest Shimura? Sasuke asked. Because if you are, I'd like the honor of doing it. Naruto shook his head, which led to the others in the room gaping at him in shock. She's a criminal. Karen argued. She is guilty of treason, you cannot just let her go. Do not make the same mistakes the third made with Danzo. Naruto seemed offended at the comment, because he glared coldly at Karen. She cowered under his intense gaze and shifted her own gaze to her feet. You misunderstand, Karen, Eno interrupted. We do not have proper evidence to arrest her, only your word. Naruto plans to confront her and put her in a situation where she will be forced to admit her crimes. All eyes turned to Ino in surprise, even Naruto looked shocked that she had already figured out what he was planning. She smiled and shrugged, she knew him, and she knew him well. She also knew that the way he would handle Shimura's case would also be different from what Sasuke and Karen wants. That is not a bad idea, Sasuke admitted as he tapped his chin. How do you plan to do it? I'm calling a high council meeting, Naruto replied. The shit's going to hit the fan figuratively speaking. Sasuke nodded, but Karen still seemed displeased. And, once she's admitted to being guilty. She demanded. She will have a trial, Naruto said. Sasuke and Karen's expressions both seemed to sour at this admittance. Suijitsu glanced at them nervously, feeling very out of place in this conversation. Don't you think she's past the stage of trial? 
Sasuke asked. Karen nodded in agreement. Naruto, however, tensed, and Ino could see he was not amused by being challenged by two people he trusted. She stepped closer to him, took his curled fist in her hand and forced it to uncurl by lacing her fingers with his. This seemed to calm him somewhat, and he squeezed her hand. If you are hinting that she should be executed on the spot, Naruto began, then you two have clearly been living under a rock since I have become Hokage. Sasuke and Karen looked taken aback by this, and Karen was ready to retort, but Naruto cut her off. Every human being, no matter what crimes they have committed, has a right to be given a second chance. And that means a fair and just trial, overseen by myself and a tribunal, Naruto stated, his voice flat and cold. You know I do not commend the death penalty, and that if I can avoid it, I do. Karen, again, wanted to speak, but Naruto's glare silenced her. I've never considered execution as the first option when it came to my enemies, Naruto continued. I always tried to negotiate, to understand why they are doing what they are doing. If you still can't accept that this is who I am, then what have you been doing all these years of knowing me? Sasuke looked embarrassed as Naruto stated this, for as one of his oldest friends, he should have known all of this already. And he did, but his anger over Karen being taken has blinded him and in his rage he had spoken without thinking. Forgive me, Naruto, Sasuke muttered. But we can't let her go unpunished. I never said she would not be punished, Naruto stated. I simply said, she would not be executed without trial. The tribunal will decide her punishment. Not to insult you or anything, Karen interrupted, but all your possible tribunal candidates are currently under a mind control technique that makes them loyal to the very criminal they are supposed to charge. I've already considered that. Naruto responded. And I already know which individuals I am going to ask to sit on the tribunal. In fact, I'm going to separate the High Council from the tribunal, their power cannot overlap, it is unbalanced. You can do that. Suijitsu asked, surprised. Naruto nodded. Yes, as long as the daimyo approves it. Do you know what that means? Suijitsu asked, suddenly excited. Sasuke and Karen stared at their friend and shook their heads. Ino was also confused, but Naruto seemed to know what Suijitsu was thinking, because he was smiling. No, please do enlighten us, Suijitsu, Karen grumbled. It was the tribunal that found Jugo unstable and dangerous and thus charged him with imprisonment. If a new tribunal is elected, we could request a retrial and Jugo could be freed. If the tribunal members don't make the same decision, Sasuke muttered. Jugo's power is hard to control and there's many that fear it. Ino, not fully understanding the extent of Jugo's powers, decided to step in. What are his powers, exactly? I don't actually know what makes him so unstable. Is there nobody that can teach him to control it? Sasuke was about to answer, when a strange expression danced over his face. He blinked rapidly, and then his eyes widened as his gaze shifted to Naruto. Naruto lifted an eyebrow in curiosity at the strange gaze his friend was giving him. What? He asked. Oi, bastard, stop looking at me like that. Sasuke. Karen tried snapping her husband from his shocked stupor, but she was unsuccessful. Even Suijitsu tried to snap him out of it by waving his hand in front of the Uchiha's face. Finally, Sasuke snapped out of it, and started laughing. His friends and wife watched him with worried expressions as his laughter grew louder, to the point where he was laughing so wildly, he was bending over. What's going on? Naruto demanded, completely confused. Sasuke's laughter slowly died down, and he wiped some tears away that had formed as a result. Oh, dope, we are the most unintelligent and idiotic ninja in history, Sasuke snorted. Oh, really? Naruto barked. Do enlighten me as to why. All these years the answer has been staring us in the face. Jugo needs to learn control. He can't do it the normal way, because then he would never have had the problem, but we all know someone who has the same abilities, and who never gives up on finding alternative ways to train and control power, Sasuke explained. His friends still weren't seeing it, so with a laugh Sasuke smacked Naruto on the shoulder. You, Lord Hokage, are a sage. Several seconds of quiet passed. And then Naruto gaped. Oh my god. Yes, Sasuke nodded. 
Oh my god, why did I not think of that? Naruto exclaimed. Ino looked confused, while Karen and Suijitsu were equally as shocked as the Hokage. In his excitement, Naruto turned to Ino and pulled her into an embrace. He spun her around, making her laugh, but she was still very confused. Oh, Uzumaki Ino, I could kiss you. He exclaimed. His smile, however, faded when he realized the slip of his tongue. Ino smiled sadly at him as he stopped spinning her, but his hands remained firmly placed on her hips. I'm sorry, he whispered. She shook her head and cupped his cheeks. No need to apologize, she whispered back. So, mind letting me on your epiphany? Naruto's smile returned. Jugo's family is known for having a natural ability to absorb natural energy. Controlling it, however, is very difficult, and since he is continuously absorbing it, he can't keep it under check. Hence why he is unstable and can have some, episodes. Ah, Ino hummed. And you being a sage or whatever fixes this, how? Naruto was full on grinning now. Because a sage is a master at gathering and controlling natural energy. Ino blinked as the information settled. Oh. She exclaimed, equally as excited now. You can teach him to control it. Or try and find a way to, yes, Naruto nodded. And I think Sasuke and I would have completely kept forgetting this skill of mine unless you mentioned teaching him control. You, Ino, are a genius. Ino felt her heart flutter when he leaned in and planted a kiss on her forehead. This is good news, Ino hummed. Shizuka wishes to visit him next week. Really? Sasuke, Suijitsu, and Karen asked, flabbergasted. She wants to see him. And Kajumi. Ino nodded. Yes. And she will be so happy to hear this great news. And oh, was Shizuka of Nades Hiko overjoyed? When she had arrived at the gates of Kanaha, Ino and Naruto were already waiting. Kajumi was a bright young girl, and very eager to meet her father. She was also curious, and continued to ask questions, some of them very random and misplaced. As they walked through the village streets, Ino explained how Jugo could have another trial, and if Naruto could prove to the tribunal that he could help find a way for Jugo to learn control, he could be freed. Shizuka had promptly halted in the middle of the street at the revelation and burst into tears. Kajumi, being the ever-loving daughter, tried to console her mother to the best of her ability, but Shizuka had simply told the girl that she was crying happy tears before embracing her. Ino watched the scene with a smile, while Naruto was trying to come to terms with the fact that emotionally controlled Shizuka was crying in the middle of his village's streets. When she finally calmed down after a cup of tea, Shizuka was ready to be reunited with her lover. The walk to his prison was slow and Ino could see the nerves settling as they got closer. Shizuka was especially on edge when they got inside and passed through the security, and Ino did not blame her. She hated the walls and seals too. Is this really okay? Shizuka asked just as they were to enter Jugo's cell. Of course, Naruto replied with a smile. Shizuka nodded and turned to open the door. Naruto's arm wrapped around Ino's waist and he pulled her against him. She looked up, surprised by his bold move. He grinned and whispered in her ear, let her go alone first. Ino nodded. The door creaked open, and Jugo, who had been reading, looked up, not having expected to have a visitor. When Shizuka walked through the door, his book clattered to the floor. Their embrace was probably the most beautiful sight Ino had ever seen. And she could not help but cry with them. That's it for part 6. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.